Hi everyone, so after that last session looking at plant-based technologies, we're going to look at them a bit more in the traditional sense now in our agrotech panel. And um, so I would like to hand over to Dr. Carol Yana Shapiro, who's the principal of Double Helix Consulting, who's going to chair the session for us. Thank you, Howard. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and uh, thank everyone for attending our session on Agritech and Sustainable Innovation 2020. We have a, a wonderful panel today of, of people with really diverse backgrounds representing different aspects of research, uh, development, uh, products, and services. Uh, so we'll have a, a lively conversation. And uh, if I could have the first slide, please. One of the things that has really uh, changed our lives are these three technologies. Uh, there was an era that we refer to as the era of physics. There was an era that referred to the era, era of chemistry. And many of us now refer to this as the era of biology and taking computing analysis and genetics. Uh, something has happened that has never happened before to allow us to have tools to operate in a totally different way. Next slide, please. So it never occurred to me in my lifetime that there would be a chip that has 1.2 trillion transistors on it. The scale of that is unimaginable. It's just completely, completely has changed how we can understand the aspect of what a chip can do and how we can link these together and how we can compute in a way that never, never was even foreseen in the past. Next slide, please. Analysis. Well, analyzing molecular systems at the molecular level has never been uh, easier, uh, or we could say number of scans per dollar. In 2004, it was almost none. And in 2015, we're close to 900 scans per dollar. So just the scale of information gathering is incredible. Next slide, please. And genetic technologies are more accessible than ever. If we look at DSDNA or SSDNA synthesis or DNA sequencing, the reads, when you look at how they become almost uh, easy to do because of the cost, when we consider what the human genome cost and how long it took $3 billion in 13 years and how you can resequence a human genome for less than $100 today in one, in one day as well, 24 hours, there's nothing we can't read or understand. Next slide, please. So the, I just wanna give you an idea of some heroines and heroes whose shoulders we stand on. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorite people of all time, Barbara McClintock, who won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine. And she did it with a microscope and five years of corn. Um, she basically came up with an idea of transposons, which means genes could actually move around. You learned this in your high school. But for that information, everything was changed because she proved without any question that transposable elements move from one site to another in the cell's DNA. And for that, she won the Nobel Prize. Next slide, please. Frederick Singer, he won two Nobel Prizes, uh, very rare in the history of the prize, but he transformed biomedical research in his first Nobel Prize. And his second prize came with even, I consider more significant advance, the Sanger sequencer. And those of us who are older, remember using the Sanger sequencer for the first time and realizing what we were reading and what we were understanding was breakthrough every time we ran another sequence on this machine. Next slide, please. Gurdiv Kush. This is an example of IR64 rice, which is the most uh, eaten rice in the world, if you will. It's grown in more places or its progeny are grown in more places. And this is just to give you an idea in the time when he did this work in the late 70s and early 80s, what it took 
to develop a new line of rice called IR64. This is all the parent lines and all the crosses that it took. And for that, he won the Wolf Foundation Prize in Agriculture, and he won the World Food Prize. Next slide, please. Frances Arnold, very simple thing. She bioengineered better enzymes in the laboratory. And when you realize it seems like so simple today because anyone can do this in any lab almost in the world based on Francis's work. Enzymes created by this technology have the, replaced toxic chemicals in many industrial processes, but that's just the tip of the iceberg for what this new way of thinking about enzymes has done for us in agriculture and innovation. And for that, she won the Nobel prize. Next, please. And Jennifer Doudna is well known for her work on CRISPR. It's some controversy whether she and her group or the Broad Institute in Massachusetts really founded the CRISPR activity. But she said very profoundly, just because we are not ready for scientific progress does not mean it won't happen. And this is significant because when we're in a lab, when we're thinking about innovation, progress is happening all the time, whether we're ready for it or not. And for that, she won the Wolf Prize. And in the next slide, I wanna show you in my lifetime what I've been able to see about a maize plant. And this is how it started when I was young. This, this is how we walked in a field and saw a maize plant. And then we looked at a corn cob. And then we looked at a seed, seven times 10 to the third, and the germ. And then we were able to see very clearly a single endosperm cell. And this is condensed chromosomes, moving on to a scaffold, and now to DNA. So imagine your lifetime working in a, in a field, looking at maize, making all your decisions, and then ending up being able to look at the DNA of that particular uh, crop and understanding things that we've never been able to understand before. In my lifetime, it's like going from the horseless carriage to the car or the Wright brothers to a 747 jumbo aircraft. So I wanted to share this with you because when we think about innovation, it's not clear exactly where innovation will come from. And today we're very, very fortunate to have uh, four extraordinary speakers with us. Uh, I'm so pleased to be able to have them all here today. Uh, Chris Patterson from Sarvio, which is a digital farming platform. Suet Matias from Grow Intelligence, which I referred to not a theory of change, but a change of theory company. Thomas Batchelor from Novazymes, and then Benjamin Bolag from a wonderful company that's doing great things about rethinking steak, which is an important part of all of our dietary regimes. So what I'd like to do is ask each of them a question. We'll have about 30 minutes to go back and forth. Uh, I would encourage other people on the panel if they have something to say about someone's presentation to come in, then we'll have online questions and answers uh, with the audience, and then a short call to action um, and summary, which I think we'll find entertaining at the last moment. So I think I'll start with Ben Hamina, and uh, you work in a very, very interesting area, which has profound implication to how we think about animal protein. And how, how would you characterize the main lessons that you've learned from cultivated meat that has anything to do with any other industry which has allowed you to move forward quickly? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so just in case anyone doesn't know what cultivated meat um, is, I'll just spend a, just 10 seconds explaining um, so essentially cultivated meat is meat made using cell culture technologies. So 
we take a small sample of cells from the animal, which we expand and guide to become muscle, fat, and all the different components that you need to recreate meat. Um, so that it becomes meat essentially that is the same down to the molecular level, but with significantly less um, uh, environmental impact, human health impact, and um, not killing any animals. Um, and a lot of the technologies essentially that we're using are coming from the biotechnology sector. And so that we're in a way borrowing and building upon um, those technologies. Now, they're used to doing things at a very small scale and really high cost, and we want to do just the opposite. Um, so there is a lot of innovation that needs to happen for us to be able to do that. Um, and I think it's also interesting to, to really look at what has happened in those industries, for example, in the regenerative medicine industry, where it's kind of had a really big hype in the years 2000, where, you know, hundreds, um, hundreds of millions and even billions were, um, were given to, you know, lots of startups. It was um, set as, you know, the hottest uh, career option. It was to be, you know, in, in that space. Um, that year, I think it was um, Times that um, that said that. Um, but then you had a massive fall. So a lot of companies having, you know, 200 plus uh, million in in funding just completely going bust because they didn't have the right business models in place, didn't have the right um, scientific foundations in place, um, and just built too much on hype rather than on on real solid foundations. So I think as our industry expands and as you know you mentioned there's a lot of hype we we really have to make sure that we we take the time to build those foundation and to think really deeply about what is the best approach what needs to be in place and don't just rush essentially to get to market um, and bring a product that doesn't deliver on on our promises essentially why cultured meat? I mean, you know, um, there are people in regenerative agriculture who are very innovative um, in regenerative um, animal production, open range versus uh, confined animal production. It seems like cultured meat, is it really a necessity for society at this point? Well, I obviously bias, so I will say yes, um, but the reason is really there are we need several solutions and it won't be just one solution that will work it's not going to be cultivated meat that takes up the whole protein but um space but the reality is that the demand for protein is increasing extremely rapidly and so we need several solutions and we believe that cultivated meat is really one of um one of the ones that is the most promising because we can really deliver on, um, you know, on getting really the same results as, um, you know, conventional meat, and really getting what the consumer exactly wants, but without some of the sacrifices that you would have to make um, in any of the other solutions. And can you actually get to scale? I mean, can you get to a scale with parity and uh, food safety issues solved? So. Today, not yet, um, but um, there is nothing that prohibits us from doing so. So there, there is nothing that we see on the horizon that would mean that there's any issues with scaling. There are some challenges. There, there are things that you know need some technological advancement before we are able to do it. Um, but there is nothing fundamentally that stops us from doing it. Um, and you're seeing as well already some uh, some of our competitors in the field starting to grow their sales, you know, in in hundreds of liters bioreactors, which is a first of the industry. Um, but obviously, for us to really reach scale at the stage where you know we're producing in the millions of kilograms of meat, um, there are some challenges without doubt. But there's nothing fundamentally stopping us from doing so. Excellent. Well, we'll come back to, I have, I have a bunch of questions. Uh, being a vegan, this is sort of an interesting curiosity to me, uh, but I, I, there's lots of questions to have. And I'm sure you know Memphis meats and the amount of money that's being spent on these cultured meats. And so let's talk about that in a few minutes, but let's, let's flip to uh, Thomas now. And 
you, you sit in an extraordinarily interesting world, Thomas. Uh, I've, I've used your products from Novozyme. I know the company very well. And I wonder how you see the potential of microbial innovation enabling more sustainable and efficient because of that agriculture feeding the world in the next 30 years. It's 2020, you have a crystal ball for 2050 and you're gonna, you're gonna tell the audience what it means to come from a company like yourself and what specifically are you gonna do to get to that efficient and sustainable? And I, I would change the word sustainable to resilient because I think you're working in the world of resilience in systems as opposed to just sustainable. Yeah, I'll be happy to share my reflection. That is of course a, a grand question you're posing. So, so we're working with what we are in Novozymes, we work with traditionally the, the enzymes for replacing chemistries, as you mentioned with the, the old Nobel laureate. Um, and now we're increasingly trying to look at the agricultural segment uh, where microbial solutions have huge potential to, uh, to add um, tools for agriculture. If you look at that longer lens, I'm really fascinated about the potential because as you see these technology drivers you mentioned in the beginning, those are exactly the keys to unlock where microbial solutions can actually become a replacement of a lot of the chemistries we have. Today, that's not the case. Today, we have solutions that complement chemistries. But imagine a future, if you go out 30 years, I see a lot of the, um, the issues we have with, uh, with pests. So we have uh, all the, uh, the pesticides we, we have challenges with today. Most of those, we actually have innovation targeting that pest control. And if you are able to apply, let's say the gene editing toolbox, uh, that would unlock a potential to get us to a level where we actually can control such pests at levels equivalent to, to chemistry. And we can be cost competitive at that uh, time horizon. So you can imagine an agriculture which has much, much less uh, reliance on, on some of the, the chemistries that are having sustainability issues. They also have pest resistance being triggered which will not naturally happen uh, with microbials. Uh, so that's one avenue where you see huge potential. The other avenue is if you look at the, the fertilizer space. So you also have uh, huge applications of fertilizers. Uh, and in reality, you have a, a hugely inefficient system. So if you look at the microbiome around plants, understanding what's really happening, we're not utilizing the potential of nature as it is today. So we can dial up that by having a high uptake of, of the natural uh, nutrients in the, in the soil. Uh, so you can reduce application of, of artificial chemistries. Um, so there's so much potential to go for. And where I really see the keys to unlock that is, is both on, on, in the lab, getting that technology unlocked, but it's really also, as, as we know, science to work with other industries, transforming agriculture, just like the cultivated meat, that's no simple task. So it's also a matter of understanding innovation is really bringing that technology to the market, having the impact. And experience from us is very much about understanding that, understanding the grower, understanding the incumbents in the marketplace, partnering with people that can disrupt the incumbents, but also partnering with the incumbents and making them realize that they need to embrace the new technology. Uh, so I, I see huge potential, but it's there's uh, some time to go and there's a lot of uh, change to a very traditional industry to go. So, so a couple, uh, one quick question. There are a couple things in agriculture that seem insurmountable. One is viruses, mm -hmm. um, which no agricultural chemistry works on that's available currently. And the other is mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. And uh, viruses are wiping out an enormous amount of crops mm -hmm. and aflatoxin impacts 4.5 billion people a year chronically, causes mm -hmm. cancer, causes stunting. The research on it is, is scary for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. How about aflatoxin? How come you all haven't knocked off aflatoxin? <laughs> Yeah, we are having it on our radar screen, I can promise you that, and, and it's also great to see that we have an ecosystem of, of others, uh, peers that are also looking at it. So 
So we, we have mycotoxins is the space where we can use microbial technology. It's already uh, being addressed also in the animal uh, side of, 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 uh, of agriculture. So I think there's so much to go for. It's frankly also a matter of kind of picking your battles because you can get lost in trying to address the totality. Uh, but those are targets that are obviously needed to be addressed there. If you look at, at a slightly longer horizon, we, we have our hands full where, where we are focused right now, but I'm, I'm very much in agreement that that's part of the, the future. Well, I want to appeal to you on aflatoxin. When you go to your next board meeting, <laughs> when you realize mycotoxins, ochratoxins, aflatoxins, the impact on human health and, and wellness is probably greater than any other problem we have mm -hmm. uh, in the health world. And oh. this would be a tremendous jump forward. Not to put you on the spot. Yeah, but I'll be happy to take a deeper look. Great to have okay. you. Okay, uh, let's go to Suet next. Um, from one of my favorite companies, Grow Intelligence. Are you there? Yes, I am. Okay, I, I just couldn't see you. Um, I, I guess what I, I want to ask about Suet is that we operate typically on a theory of change. Most analytics, they go along very smoothly and we look at things a certain way and it's the way it's been done forever. The first time I met one of your founders, we talked about a change of theory, that the way analytics had been done up to that point gave you so many false positives that a lot of the data was unusable. So can you, help us understand what I would call the grow intelligence revolution on data and agriculture? What we want to do is to, to get all the data, like disparate data on agriculture and climate that was available in, in many different silos and make it accessible, reliably so. Um, and in order to, to make it useful, what we needed to do was standardize the format and organizing it into an ontology that we had to create. And so once you've struck, then you create a, a pretty powerful platform form that people can work off of versus that it was, uh, you know, for the longest time, which was that, uh, you know, not standardized, collected at odd times and, you know, kind of um, uh, transformations that the data needed to go through to make it useful. But, but now that the data that's available and, and, you know, the way that we can process it cheaply enough to, to be able to make it very powerful and useful is, is kind of what makes it uh, revolutionary now is, you know, that you can have a view on any commodity uh, or not, or any food source or any climatic condition happening or lead up to it and build powerful models um, on a platform that you're looking at Rwanda today, you could switch to Vietnam in a few hours, go to the Midwest and look at soil moisture levels there and you know, flip over and see other parts of the world. And that has been an ability to, to kind of have your hand at the pulse of supply for, of agricultural goods globally. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great at, at this time with, you know, computing uh, power being what it is and the cost of using it being very low um, to have created a, a system that can organize it and allow us to be able to use it. And that's what we did as a company. And, and you actually can out forecast, out predict, out analyze most national ag research groups. Uh, it seems like your data is better, cleaner and more accurate. Uh, do you work with any big groups like governments around the world to help them clean their data and get it more accurate? No, I mean, so we, uh, yes, you're right. It was a surprise to us as a, as a young company to find that we could predict better than 
you know, amazing um, organizations like the USDA, which have hundreds of thousands of employees and have, you know, historically done this for a long time. So that do collect some data are working the, with them as well. They're invaluable. I think that we would not be able to do what we do uh, if we didn't have, you know, uh, government um, kind of governmental uh, bodies like the USDA and across the world from, you know, from China to parts of Africa to, to Europe that, that actually collect this data. Because I don't think that a lot of them have not gotten um, well, they believe that they collect the data. They don't believe that, you know, it took a long time for them to admit that our, our models were performing better. So uh, we do not work with them to clean up their data. Um, we use them as an input. Now uh, we use them as an input and, you know, we work with them as we refine our models now. They view us as partners versus, you know, kind of viewing us as, you know, people that were saying something that was not aligned with what they wanted to predict. Um, but you know, they are an invaluable partner. I don't think that would be able to do a lot of the stuff that we do, even though we do get data from kind of the UN organizational, kind of the WFPs of the world for prices and things like that. Government, ministries of agriculture, uh, ministries of finance, the, the stuff that's collected there, customs data and things like that, that give us visibility into, into flows of a lot of these commodities would not be possible without uh, partnering with, uh, with governments across the world. Excellent. And what, what is your sort of crystal ball on the next five to 10 years on climate? Oh. Well, I mean, uh, what's undeniable is that a lot of these uh, extreme events are, are happening more frequently. Uh, and more, you know, in general. Um, from a production stance, as well as from um, a lot of the stuff that you, you know, kind of biotic factors where we're seeing a lot of pests uh, and other things that are happening. Um, so it, it, is, it is even more important to keep track of it and to have the ability to, you know, You know, to track yields and we've seen over the last few months how you know supply chains uh, and have been disrupted so the ability of any government or or, or um, you know company that has exposure to um, to, to these inputs to have a, a much keener insight in to what is happening but to be able to track how things are going because it seems like, and, and be able to, to, to react faster because these events are, are happening and they will continue to happen. And, and as we see the trends, um, a lot of people have, are not hedged um, to, to withstand, um, you know, many things that will disrupt the way that, um, you know, business as usual is. Excellent, excellent. All right, I have a lot of questions we're gonna come back to over the next few minutes, but let's have Chris weigh in. Uh, Chris is with a very interesting company based out of Canada, Gervario. And uh, Chris, I, I, I know you grew up on a farm, which gives a different perspective to most people. And, and you work for a large global company now. But Gervario, you refer to as the digital farming company. So we all understand the word digital. We all understand the word farming, but what is meant by digital farming? Thanks, Art. Uh, yeah, I suppose um, um, digital farming uh, means different things to different companies in, in the space, but uh, mainly it refers to uh, you know harvesting all the opportunities that are emerging through data right now. So uh, throughout the whole agri-food ecosystem, whether it's upstream or downstream from the actual farmland, uh, there's always ways to do better, do, do things better with data. So um, whether that's, uh, you know, the supply chain logistics or um, better optimizing the performance of the products being used, um, you know, there's lots of uh, complexities on a farm itself um, and managing those things at a higher level. 
um, measuring and managing sustainability and all the things that go with that. Um, there's, you know, uh, finding marketplaces to buy from or to sell into. Um, the automation of farm equipment is a big category right now. Uh, differentiating the food that's being sold. So telling its story to the consumer and highlighting how it's better or unique. Uh, those are all data related things that are opening up to us right now. So that is kind of the umbrella that we call digital farming. So um, in our case, our, our company is called Zarvio. Uh, uh, we're part of BASF. So BASF is a global organization that uh, uh, manufactures the, a lot of the crop input products and um, Zarvio uh, manages uh, their approach to digital farming. And uh, so we're very focused on, on the opportunities emerging right now through the data. So a lot of what Sue was just talking about, you know, how to uh, compare and contrast the different data layers and, and uh, you know, machine learning and how to create this artificial intelligence from that and then deploy it out into the field to do things better. So, um, you know, in the near term, we're looking at uh, data sources right now, like satellite imagery and weather stations and equipment sensors and soil moisture sensors. And we're, we're using all that to uh, further optimize the performance, uh, the infield performance of, ex of our existing product portfolio and, and the safety and the reliability of these products. And, and at the same time, we're also looking a little bit uh, uh, further into the future saying, um, you know, how can we use these data streams to improve uh, not only the, 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 the outcomes, but the, uh, the business model. So we're looking at, um, you know, uh, delivering more um, agronomic outcomes versus selling the individual products or, uh, um, you know, asking our customers to use a decision support platform. So as an example, we could deliver uh, a weed free field or a disease free field. And uh, for us to be able to, uh, you know, accept the risk and deliver that to the farm, um, of course, there's a lot of technology and a lot of data that goes into being able to do that reliably. So, so that's what we're working on is the next step. And then, um, you know, beyond that, um, we're really excited about uh, the next evolution, which is the seed and spray technologies. So instead of managing a whole field at a time, um, you know, we're now starting to manage um, different zones of the field uniquely. Um, if you've you know, seen if any, any field out there has got hilltops and depressions and different types of soil as you migrate across the field. So how can you manage that differently instead of just one consistent recipe for that whole field? So um, uh, the sea and spray let technology takes it one step let further. Me, oh. Let me ask you a question though. You said yeah. something that I've never heard anyone say before, uh, except risk for delivering outcomes yeah does, does that mean you're like an insurance company if, if someone buys your product you're actually going i mean when you say accept risk yeah is yeah we're zarvio and the farmer but zarvio yes uh so right now a farmer would buy a product and it would be up to the farmer to get that product applied properly and, and uh, know when to use it or how to use it. Um, um, where we see it moving to is um, delivering um, the outcome rather than selling the ingredients. So yeah, there's definitely risk being moved from the farm to our camp. And uh, we would say, we'll sell you a, say a weed free field. And it's up to us to, to think on how to deliver that. And uh, it's up to us if it doesn't work to to guarantee that product. So, so that's what we mean so by you, delivering agronomic outcomes. So you really you have, you have taken systems biology to the to the extreme in agricultural production. You're looking at every single aspect of that system and taking responsibility for it, having done all the analytics on risk and what have you as a big company that has horsepower to do that. Is that true? Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of learning that's happening right now. And, and uh, I think in some of those we're in our infancy stage and some we're, we're well down the road. So um, we're definitely, um, you know, building the competencies and building not only the competencies, but the culture 
um, uh, around data and how to how to use it better. And and at the, at the farm level and at the corporate level, there's lots of uh, different ways of thinking emerging. So I, I think uh, risk management is definitely a, a big part of that. And um, and I think going forward, especially when you look at like our our the one that we're really excited about is a is a smart spray technology. So you're not managing a whole field or even a zone of a field, but one individual plant at a time. And so uh, if that's a weed, you want to control it. If it's a crop uh, uh, plant, you want to uh, either control the disease on it or, or perhaps it needs nitrogen or a micronutrient. And so um, that's going to uh, really significantly reduce uh, the, the amount of product being used in the fields and Im improve the, the health of that field. So um, that's that's where it's going next. And we're working on that with our prototypes right now. So. Uh, that is going to change the way that farming happens. There's going to be a lot of automation. So we're going from, uh, you know, sensing to artificial intelligence right through to a robotic outcome. Uh, and that that's where I think, you know, the, the business model that goes along with that is going to look very different than, than we're doing today, our, our relationship with farmers today. So, and uh, okay, thank if you look, I was just going to say one more thing. Uh, if you look beyond that, okay. there's you know, biologics, there's gene editing, there's, you know, maybe we're controlling things with electricity or UV light. So there's a whole uh, suite of technologies that are emerging right now that are also going to change the way that we think about how to do things in a field. So great, because I mean, there's obviously some connections with a, uh, a group like Novozymes that is probably one of the, the you know, if we look at what they do, no one knows how to do it better, essentially. So you are, it seems like some parallel paths here. We'll get to that in a minute, though. But I, I want to go back to this cultured meat because it's, uh, it's fascinating to me. Um, but, I, you know, I, can, can you explain to us why induced pluripoint stem cells are the future of cultivated meat? And for those in the audience who might not understand what a pluripoint uh, stem cell is, why this is the breakthrough? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, essentially when you're looking at, um, you know, growing cultivated meat, you have a choice between different types of stem cells. And we've chosen along with some other companies to go with induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, so essentially if you want in nature, you have adult stem cells and embryonic stem cells. And this is a way of taking any cell in, in the animal's body and bring it back to the embryonic state. Um, so what that means is that you can expand those cells infinitely and you can make any type of tissue from it. So this is a technology that won um, the Nobel Prize back in 2012. Um, and really the, the advantage is because you can expand those cells infinitely, you don't have to go back to the animal um, constantly when you, you grow. You have a system that's kind of a lot more reliable. You have a lot less batch to batch variations. Um, those cells as well grow at about um, two, twice um, the rate as adult stem cells. You can, um, you can grow them in suspension. So what that means is typically you'll, if you want to, to grow adult stem cells, you have to grow them on two dimensions. So you have different ways. So you have to use micro carriers and the different ways where you can get them to, to grow in three dimensions, but it's a lot more difficult. Whereas with induced pluripotent stem cells, it's a lot easier um, to do so. So we really see that, um, that type of cell as being the leading one um, in the future. Um, as, as the companies advance. So for the average consumer, I, I can see on the label, made with induced pluripoint stem cells for your benefit and enjoyment. And most people would pick <laughs> up the package and not feel comfortable with it. I mean, how do you overcome so, this notion? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a couple of I, things. I, must... I mean, I don't think necessarily the consumer will have to know which type of stem cells it is. I think the advantage to the consumer is that they'll have a more, a better product, essentially, a product that's more reliable, that's able to be more complex because you can really get all the different types of tissue more easily. So I think but it will me, really be in terms of Stop right price. there. I mean, 
you know, it's more reliable. What's more reliable than a cow? I mean, a cow or a, a, a beef production. I mean, you know, it's pretty reliable. They got their genetics down flat. And um, what does that mean, more reliable from your perspective? Is it disease-free? So you're, it, this is never going to get E. coli or salmonella or anything else. Yeah, no, absolutely. What is, what is I mean, the sales pitch? I mean, I think for the consumer, it, it's really that it's so a lot less likelihood um, to get. So that when I say a lot less likelihood, because if we say there is no chance of getting foodborne diseases, people will think you can leave it outside of your fridge and, you know, for, for months and it will be fine, which it won't. Um, so there's a lot less likelihood because we can screen for all those um, diseases that you just mentioned. Um, on top of that, obviously, I think people are becoming more and more conscious of the environmental impact of the impact that, you know, having, you know, having meat with antibiotics is having, um, is having on us. So for the consumer, it's, it's getting that, but without making a sacrifice. And I think at the end of the day, there will be a lot that comes down to three things, right? What does the consumer care about? There's price, so getting to price parity, taste, so, and that will be, you know, a lot of free sample tastings um, in supermarkets and convenience. So making sure that we scale fast enough so that we can be a, in all the right places. Okay, well. Uh, but there is a lot of work in terms of consumer acceptance without doubt, right? Yes, yeah, I mean, that'll be a question we'll get to in the next round. Uh, Thomas, um, what do you see as the key to unleash the full potential of microbial innovation being adopted in agriculture? I mean, I, I listened to what Chris said and, you know, it's pretty interesting stuff. They're actually semi de-risking the farmer or de-risking the farmer. Uh, with this package, I'm really interested in nitrogen fixation myself uh, mm. because a lot of the nitrogen that is applied is blown away or washed away. And uh, it seems like an environmental disaster, which we know it is, during the great oil spill, golf oil spill in the United States, Stephen Chu, who was then the Secretary of Energy, asked farmers just to reduce the application on the fields that eventually bled into the Mississippi River to just reduce it 10%. And they wouldn't do it because they were afraid they would have some loss, even though 30% blows away, 30% washes away, and 30% hits the target. Maybe the numbers are a little skewed, maybe it's a little better, some places than others. But nitrogen is obviously the biggest game in the environmental question. How quickly can you deliver 85% or 90% of the nitrogen needed for maize to grow in the field? Um, yeah, it's really a cool uh, potential and, and the, the, um, the potential of unleashing this in, in agriculture is very much starting at the grower side because you can see you get test results and we have very fascinating things, but as you see the grower behavior, as you illustrated yourself with the example from the Mississippi River, they are really ingrained in the risk. So before they adopt a new technology, they don't look even at very solid scientific papers. They really need to believe it on their own farm, having seen it work repetitively. And with, with the reality of agriculture, there's a lot of, of variability from all other factors. So we've seen kind of the adopting, adoptance rate is really the trick here, getting it out there and being a reliable uh, solution. Um, and that's where I think you really get to the, the potential of, of, of new technologies, whether it's biologicals and ag or, or cultivated meat or many other things, you underestimate kind of this adoption curve. Sometimes it comes exponentially and especially consumer behavior can be that, but in agriculture, growers, they are conservative. So that's where I think we have a collective journey here on, on, on getting, getting that adoptance up. Because for example, with nitrogen fixation, if we can really get farmers to reduce the applied nitrogen and rely on, on microbial solutions, that would be a massive win. Uh, but even with technology from, uh, from competitors of ours out there now, we are seeing challenges there because they are still being conservative and they still 
like to have the insurance, so they put it on top. They keep their nitrogen rates, and then they put these microbials on top. And they're used to trying to chase more yield, not reducing the input because they are afraid of, of the risk there. So it's back to the risk and maybe the business model part of it, being willing to pay to go in and say, okay, if you apply this and reduce your rate, we guarantee, and then you get back to the digital act because then you need to have metrics and, and ability to, to follow up on that kind of business model. So I think there's a, there's a cool potential across these technologies with microbials and digital ag and then some willingness to have financial exposure, which can drive that adoption rate. So um, I'm really intrigued, but it's very tricky in practice. So, so I, in a company like Novozyme, which is a global powerhouse, is nitrogen near the top of your list of things that you want to deliver? Um, to a farm, I'm, I'm going to ask you about aflatoxin next or the next <laughs> round. But uh, I, yeah, I I'm really int nitrogen is, is on top uh, above aflatoxins. I think for us, we've looked at it before. I think in reality, I think we see the gene editing toolbox being critical to just technically reach a level where we can can really replace nitrogen to the level needed to to create adoption. So for us, that has opened a door for us to invest more heavily in it. Uh, and our friends around the corner in, in Davis are, are helping us where we do kind of the gene editing in, in Novozymes, uh, because we do see that as a huge potential. And you also see the trend in, in the world as increased pressure from regu regulators to reduce this the leaching of nitrogen into the waterways. So we see technical potential, we see macro trends regulators supporting this and the, the path of, of getting potential in here is also if we can collaborate with regulators say we have a solution because the problem by reducing chemical inputs in ag is if you don't have an alternative agriculture will not be providing the food for the world so if we can provide a solution that with some regulatory incentives around it will be adopted that's that's a path i believe will be uh, accelerating the uh, the potential of these technologies great we're going to continue asking questions about this um, the, the issue in many ways and all the panelists and the audience may, may have some questions about this, we're reaching yield potential. It, it's, it's not simple to grow more maize with the genetics we have. No matter how much nitrogen we put on the field, we're peaking. It's happening with soy. It's happening with, with other of the top 10 agricultural crops. That's in the global north. In the global south, the application of the kind of work that Zarvio is doing or Novozyme is doing has great application because the yields are so much lower. And we have to, in today's discussion, think about innovation to the global south as well to the global north because most of our companies work in the global north the most. And it's, it's because of that uh, there's a disparity of yield. But we'll get to that in a minute. I just put that out there. I want to remind the audience, you can send in questions and we'll try to answer them as quickly as possible. Uh, one uh, question came in for Suet. That is, what is the business model of grow intelligence and how do you ensure that the predicted models reach not only decision makers, but smallholders? And this is a, a major question that we see in every forum, whether it's the World Food Program or the FAO or the World Bank, how do you reach smallholders with the kind of knowledge that Grow Intelligence is generating? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, our business model is that you know, we sell access to our platform, obviously, and, and, and you know, at different levels, you know, some that can just come on a web app and see whatever outputs for our models are. And there's a free version where you know we make our, our model our, our main model which was the, you know our corn yield models are actually available the white paper is up on our website anybody can see it and we create the result so we're not you know kind of going with the model of like a black box and we just give you a prediction and you trust us and it's recreatable um as it relates to the small global south is that you know yield models or, or kind of drought indices and things like that 
you know, when you think of a small hold farmer, the kind of information they need is really not that there's a drought coming or, you know, the, 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 you know, the production levels in different parts of the world. I mean, there's, I always said that the problem at the farmer level is not, you know, this type of information as much as it is the ecosystem around it, kind of the input companies, knowing what type of varietals to provide, what type of, you know, fertilizer blend, blending uh, sort of information can be imparted to the farmer at that local level um, versus kind of macro. Um, so that information is available for anyone just to answer the question and grow, but we don't serve the smallholder farmer, we serve the ecosystem around them so that banks can extend credit because now they can actually quantify risk. Um, equipment manufacturers, can determine the smallholder far healthier by information and assess risks and determine what market exists. Excellent. I, I have a, a, a specific question that didn't come from the audience, but I'm interested in. Did you pr predict uh, fall armyworm in Africa or the locust? Was, was that within the domain of your all's uh, algorithms? Yeah, absolutely. The four army worms in China, actually, we started seeing it and the kind of the susceptibility of certain areas as we saw, you know, the, the, the disease migrating so that, you know, we were it was actually geared a lot more to food companies that were sourcing from these specific areas. So if you know that, that you know this area was susceptible to fall army worms and you could see our model predicting that and you don't see yields falling in a significant way, some chemicals that were not <laughs> allowed to be sprayed had been sprayed and things like this that were allowing people to, you know, to, to, to find the risk. The other thing that we did that you mentioned is the locusts, yes. So we started tracking them sometime. last year uh, and that we actually made a publicly available to, to anyone as well as uh, we availed our services for free to the governments that were most affected especially in, in eastern and uh, eastern Africa and parts of Asia. Great. Chris, um... BASF is a, a huge company. Uh, entrepreneurship is often not the hallmark of large companies, which are like ships on the ocean, hard to turn. But Zarvio is a cutting edge company. Uh, we have a lot of people who are interested in entrepreneurship on the call today. Students who are thinking about where do I go when I graduate from various universities, Cambridge and other places. Did you build Zarvio inside or was Zarvio built outside and then brought inside? Yeah, Zarvio um, is, is kind of unique, I would say, where it, it, it functions very much like a, a startup company. However, it was uh, initiated right inside a big global company. So, um, you know, we had uh, good resources available. Uh, and a lot of market access and uh, a lot of, uh, you know, different information we could tap into, but, but uh, it started as a very tiny team and we had our own P and L and our own brand and uh, uh, grew it up from there. And, and um, yeah, I think uh, another thing is that we, um, we have to really reach out to the innovation ecosystem to, to move faster and access more technology. So, um, Historically, you know, you, uh, the interactions between large global companies and, you know, uh, four people starting a, a new company out of their garage, you know, has not been a typical uh, relationship, but, but that's the kind of stuff that's happening a lot more frequently now. So um, I think a lot of the uh, top talent that's coming out of the university system and a lot of the top talent that's even, you know, veterans of the industries 
are, are landing in these uh, very early stage innovation companies. So um, for, for a big company to access that talent and their ideas and their technologies, uh, we have to learn how to collaborate. And so that's where Zarvio as, as a, a small company within a big company has, has been able to really uh, think differently about how to collaborate with early stage companies and um, whether that is uh, you know, a, a licensing agreement or a R&D partnership, or maybe uh, we can tap the, the venture division of our company to, to help support this company and further uh, develop them. Um, maybe ultimately it's an acquisition. You know, there's lots of different ways we can interact with these early stage innovation companies and being one ourselves, uh, the cultures line up really well. So we can be very agile and, and uh, more responsive in the marketplace. So, so it is possible to be uh, quick moving and innovative in a large company. Not easy probably, but there must be a, 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 a series of people listening from that coming from uh, the staff and the technicians and the researchers. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of people uh, that are interested in this kind of entrepreneur uh, model and, and definitely we have high visibility within our company and, and high visibility outside of our company too. And, uh, you know, we, we have, um, managed to move very quickly, go from uh, literally uh, product conceptualization through to uh, R&D stage, uh, beta testing, and right through to commercialization and, and a revenue model uh, within three years. So that is, um, you know, unheard of in the, in the large company scales. Um, typically, you know, an R&D cycle might be 10 or 20 years for a lot of the stuff being worked on. And, and so uh, to go from uh, a blank whiteboard and defining your budget to, to commercialization in, in just a few years is, is a new concept. And there's definitely a lot of uh, interest in how that can happen more often. Gotcha. Benjamina, someone said in a question that said, uh, how much better is cultivated meat for the environment considering the plastic reagents, lab facility, power usage at all? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I think there's two things to consider. You have what's happening at the lab scale at the moment um, and what will it actually look like um, at scale when we're in full production. And when you think about things like the plastic usage, yes, you know, a lab today uses, you know, a certain amount of plastics, but realistically we're at lab scale, you know, globally, this is not a huge, plastic usage and as we um, as you know we grow and this becomes industrial processes we won't really use that huge amount um, of plastics unless people use um, single use bioreactors which I think most people um, won't um, so I think in terms of plastics there's um, less of a concern and particularly when we look at packaging we should be able to have a longer shelf life so again we can look maybe more easily at innovative um, packaging, but in the same way as, you know, all, all different aspects of the food production is looking at innovative packaging, we can do, um, we can do the same. Um, I think when it comes to reagents, um, again, this is an area where at the, at the moment, frankly, it's, it's still way lower than um, when you do a life cycle assessment, it's still way lower than um, conventional um, meat production, but it's an area that obviously each company needs to exactly look at every single reagents that they use um, and be able to to assess, you know, what is the impact that um, this reagent has. And until uh, everyone's processes are defined and are, you know, modeled what it will look like at scale and what will that impact be at scale, then it's impossible to give exact numbers but um the way even looking at you know taking it off the shelf the way it is today it's already better than than um what is able um yeah what is the tradition what the traditional model is um and i think coming back to your question howard earlier on um what we need to be careful as an industry about is you know there are the standards that are, you know, that you can find online and, you know, beef will have X amount of greenhouse 
greenhouse gas emissions and so on. Um, but we need to also make sure that we're not just better than the standards, but also then all the innovations that are happening in traditional um, agriculture as well. And so that we offer such a significant um, change that it's worth as well making, um, making the switch. So th there was a, a follow-up question that uh, basically asked, how do, you, how do you think the potential conflict, and I'm sure there is a conflict, between livestock farmers and cultured meat companies can be solved before it starts? Uh, I remember there was this uh, TV personality, Oprah Winfrey, who made a comment one time about hamburger meat when she was down in Texas. And she, she was just eviscerated uh, by the response. And, you know, you got a lot of pretty big players in the, what I would call industrial or semi-industrial meat production probably eight or 10 companies dominated globally. And they don't see you as a good deal. They see you as a, as a threat. Uh, they see you as a threat that you might one day equal the price that they sell price their meats for, where yours are still quite a bit higher at this juncture because of scale. But is it possible to solve this conflict before it starts? It's possible, but there will, I mean, I think there will undoubtedly be people that are against it and that will, won't try and cooperate. But what we found is that the best way to, you know, to, to approach um, any potential conflict in the future is to really collaborate and have an open discussion. So we were, for example, um, quite often in touch with different, um, different meat producers around the UK and globally and trying to understand what is the best way that we can involve them um, and how can we make sure that, you know, we don't necessarily just grow, like we don't become, it doesn't become a war essentially, right? Between, between the two industries, what are the ways where maybe by taking cell lines from their animals, maybe um, and paying royalties, you know, on that. Maybe um, there's ways of, you know, several meat companies have invested in those fields so that they can generate some revenues um, from that. There's methods way, where maybe we can try and understand what are the, the different elements that we need in our production and how can they, um, they integrate. Obviously anyone doing processing is a lot easier than, you know, people doing just the farming part because of the processing, the downstream processing, there will be a lot of similarities. So anyone doing processing, if they're already making sausages, whether they take our beef or you know another beef, then it, it makes less of a difference. I think the, the more difficult conversation is more upper, um, yeah, upper in the chain and, and trying to understand how can we involve them in a way that makes sense. And I think, the best way to avoid um, to avoid conflicts as much as we can is to have an open discussion and, and connect. I, I, I have two words for you. Good luck. Uh, I, I think it's, I know. It, I think it's <laughs> I much harder. <laughs> no, no. I think it's you know there's an antagonism about startup industries. It may be that one day these giants will subsume you and do exactly what you're doing, but on a giant scale. Uh, because it's possible. And then you've got people like Impossible or Beyond who are making equivalents of pork and other things that they're actually building factories in China because African swine flu, which no one ever thought would get to China, got to China and wiped out a, a very large percentage of the uh, pork production there. And Do I working be, on pork? <laughs> yeah, but it'll be interesting to see if a market like China and companies that are working on faux meats, I don't know how you want to call it, but the Impossibles, the Beyonds, these other companies, Nestle has one, uh, many other companies have them as well. I'm sure there's more in the pipeline. They're going to try to displace you completely. So 
we'll get to that question next. I, I'm going to get to Thomas for the next question because he, in a note I, he sent me uh, when I, we asked some questions about what would you really like to have asked, um, he talked about collaborations. And, and this to me was a, a very insightful thing that uh, Novozymes is collaborating with, with Bayer in a close alliance. It's, I don't mm -hmm. think it's a secret, so we can talk about it. Um, what, what it means to get that type of intellectual powerhouse between institutions like yourself and them together, what, I mean, anything's possible at that point. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you really are taking, I, I mean, a giant leap. And I, I'm just curious how you think about it because mm -hmm. they're like a, the 400 pound gorilla in the room. I know Novozyme's a big country, company, but you know, how can you deal with this? Yeah, and, and I think it actually it goes back to the, the discussion we just have about being seen as a disruptor or, or a potential partner. And, and Novozyme's we've kind of had, we have the scale that's big enough to go into the dialogues with the giants, but we are still small in that scale. But sometimes we're successful it's like taking what's seen as kind of somewhat of an maybe a not validated science and it's not scalable to become something the big guys want to play with and then go into that dialogue and, and open them to be more embraceive of that technology and, and become a partner in it. I think it's, we have mixed experiences. So I want to be very frank enough to, to point at buyer, but I think we operate with what we call a flexible partner model because sometimes the big gorillas are great because they can, give you a path to the market. But we also have realized we need to be flexible. We need to be able to also partner with the startups to try to disrupt them. Because if you get tied in to what can be an exclusive alliance construct, you also get hampered by whatever they wanna do as a giant in the industry. So what we see as the model uh, for success is to have all those dialogues also to get some uh, some collaboration going, but not to be tied in because that does not work for us. So we think you need to play on both avenues, but but it's really key for us. And experience tells us we have a technology powerhouse, but but even as a mid-sized large company, we can't transform industries. So we need to partner with with the value chain that takes our technologies out and can help us dis, uh, disrupt industries. So. Uh, we partner both with big guys, but also with small disruptors. Gotcha. Um, how, how are you going to get this, these new th materials you're producing? It, I mean, it's easy to distribute it to the global north. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But the global south is where your nitrogen fixation mm -hmm. work, where the yields are a tenth of what they are in the global north could yeah. quadruple the yields or triple the yields. I mean, are you working with the World Food Program or foundations to, yeah. to get that material out? And it, it's, it's a great question. I, I just had a session this morning uh, on kind of a smallholder farming uh, a venture we're trying to create because you need to rethink your model to go there. So we have a dialogue with the uh, of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example, because if you want to go out there, you need to do it in a different way. You need to have patience because the business return is not easy. So there's there's one part which is kind of this smallholder farming, uh, where we have more of a sustainability play initially. Long term, there's business in it, and then I think talking global south, of course, in agriculture, the the Argentina Brazil type of market is is really a very advanced market. So that that works similarly to to the US, but the smallholder farming is really, really tricky. Uh, we focused on India uh, because we have a good footprint in India and we are, uh, we are quite successful there because as you say, the actual yield benefit or the benefit of our solutions are much, much bigger there than they are in the US. So it's very easy to document this as a benefit. Then the trick is to get it out there uh, to get it to the farmer in a way that's, that's useful can say China is another huge potential of over-fertilization. So the ag input usage in China blows away the U.S. Uh, and it's, it's overused. So you have so much potential to 
both improve farming practices, but also apply microbials. But to be frank, we haven't succeeded yet. You also have the traditional IP issues, because if you sell a microbe, that's a living organism, you can steal it, and then you have that microbe and you can kind of take it and, and uh, repopulate. So there are a lot of a lot of challenges, but we are trying to unlock it with a different business model mindset. It's, it's so important. I mean, the comment you made about, and I made, and you reaffirmed about the impact on yields in the global south in many places, not Argentina, not Brazil, not Chile, but the rest of South America is in a hole. Mm. They, they grow things like maize mm. for a, 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 a phenomenal amount of their effort is, is maize. And maize is all over China if you travel rural China. Uh, there are just, it just seems like someone like, I hope that Bill and Melinda Gates understand the impact for ending chronic hunger in these regions and what it might mean to make a plant even more drought tolerance or mm. water use efficient with easier microbes. Because I mean, nitrogen's fine, mm. but could, could you make the plant more water and nutrient use efficient in the future? Mm. All right, we need to ask more questions of people. Um, we'll move on to suet. And how do you take what you're doing to grow intelligence and make it available to the global south, for instance, um, which I know you're in Kenya and I, I know Sarah began in Kenya this entire effort, but it's, it's hard to reach a small farmer. You know, it turns out they all have cell phones now. Uh, many places give you the cell phone and sell you minutes like they started in India and that's gone around the world. So it's not a, a problem to get information out, but how do you really get there must be a social side of your businesses as well as a highly commercial side, knowing the founders of your company. Mm -hmm. How do you get it out there? Yeah, that, I mean, you're right. Uh, it's the, everybody has a cell phone now and there's a lot of kind of market solutions and platforms that have been built by, by a lot of donors and, and some governments that to, um, to show visibility into a marketplace more than anything. So the, the, at the most basic level, we have free ag, we have a, a, a free, um, tier in our information, in our, in our product. Okay. So, so a small farmer can access that. Uh, but obviously that is access through a, a web app uh, and the smartphones that is, you know, we have, you know, we work some of our um, data is input into what is sent via text uh, as information around their networks. Um, so, but, but at the most basic levels, one of the things that we've always wanted to do is the more this data and access. So, We We're have having... a, a free access of the most. Okay, I, I want to move on because I just got a note. We're down to, to, to five yeah. minutes to it. Uh, I want to ask each, each person a very simple question. How come? If, if you could say, how come we haven't developed nitrogen fixation in maize already? How come we haven't fixed aflatoxin? How come? What, Chris, what would be your how come? How come we haven't the following? And we're down to three or four minutes. So precisely, what would be your how come? Uh, specific to nitrogen fixation, you mean? or uh, so Anything in your world, anything in your world. Um, uh, I think that uh, farming is uh, seasonal and it has big, uh, big cycles as well. So um, the, the adoption rate uh, takes some iterations so that that cycle happens slow, slower than in the consumer world. And there's okay. also uh, low margins, high risk. So that's another reason why adoption happens slower. <laughs> okay. Uh, ben Hamina, how come? So I, I guess in my end, why, why not cultivated meat hasn't been made yet, right? 
Yes. Because nitrogen uh, fixation is not my expertise, so I would leave it um, <laughs> to other people um, to answer much, probably much better. But um, with cultivated meat, I think there needs to be two things in place, as, as was mentioned a couple of times today. One is consumer acceptance and the demand really from that end, and the other is the technology on the biotech on the biotech field being ready. And I think to date, neither of those were ripe and it's now getting really, really close to it. Um, but okay. you really need to have those two intersect. Thomas, how come? I think the very short version is technology and that's coming very close. But I think the, the explanation that we got from Canada on adoption in ag is very much the second one. So those two, uh, but more the, the, the adoption than the technology now. Okay, I want to thank everybody. This, is, this has been a, a great conversation. Benjamina, Thomas, Suet, Chris, I want to thank you very, very much for spending time with us in the, at the GAP Summit 2020. And uh, for those of you who have some free time tonight, I would encourage you all to go to this site. It's called Foldit, F-O-L-D-I-T, Aflatoxin Puzzle. Mm -hmm. and uh, fold proteins. Uh, we won't say you're right or wrong, you get scored. Uh, we have about 450,000 people playing this game. It's folded aflatoxin puzzle. And we hope to figure out how to detoxify aflatoxin in storage. Uh, a number of you are gonna work on detox making crops aflatoxin free, but in storage is also a problem. And when you go online, it's intuitive. You can fold proteins. We give you instructions. And I want to thank uh, Rebecca for helping organize this. And uh, I think we've shared information that is useful to everybody on, on this conference today. Thank you all very much. Excellent. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you to Howard for chairing the discussion and to, to both Thomas, Chris, Benjamin, and Sue for your valuable contributions. It's Lovely to hear you all coming from such different parts of the, the field um, and the, the different things that you can bring to the conversation is excellent. Um, so we're now moving directly on to a keynote um, from uh, pivoting away from agrotech and moving into industrial biotech. Um, we welcome Joanna Dupont Ingus, who's the head of EU affairs at European Bioplastics. So Joanna joined European Bioplastics this year in June 2020. Uh, where she's responsible for liaising between the industry and the European institutions and the Brussels-based stakeholders on all matters related to the bio-based plastics and their role in delivering on the promise of the EU's Green Deal and orga organic waste recovery targets. Um, so for 11 years prior to this, Joanna worked at Europa Bio, uh, which is the European Association of Bio Industries. Um, and she worked within its healthcare, agricultural and industrial biotech sectors. Um, but she's going to speak to us about the industrial biotech sector today. 